title of this SAND conference is The Emergent Universe. And during this session and our longer session, we'll be discussing your emergence embryologically and the resultant fluent ocean within you. My name is Mauro Zapatera. I have all my degrees listed above there. <laughs> I did my MD-PhD at Harvard Medical School. I also studied polarity therapy, craniosacral therapy, and Reiki during that time period. I now have a private practice in Pasadena, California, where I practice physical medicine and rehabilitation, and I work at the Los Angeles VA healthcare system. The title of my talk is The Cerebrospinal Fluid, Connecting to the I Am. The I Am, to me, is that inner sense of beingness, your perception, your inner perception of your existence. And I love that Maurizio gave the introduction of how this talk was inspired, and if you come to the longer talk, you'll see more inspirations. Numerous artists have depicted our energetic bodies manifesting as physical form. Many times there appears a vortex or some sort of swirling energy with a condensation or differentiation of that energy from some source energy to a focal point in the center of your brain. This presentation will be on the embryonic fluids and the cerebrospinal fluid as a potential conveyor of this energy to our physical bodies. In your brain right now, this is a fact, there are fluid-filled cavities. These are called ventricles. At the center of your brain, at the same location of your third eye, your brow center, there is a cavity called the third ventricle. The third ventricle is an exact midline space. Its boundaries are the pituitary gland in front and the pineal gland in back. The thalamus and the hypothalamus on the sides. The space in between these structures, in this space, has been called the Crystal Palace by Taoists and the Cave of Brahma in some Hindu yogic traditions. This space is filled with fluid. It is the cerebrospinal fluid. What is the cerebrospinal fluid? The cerebrospinal fluid is a clear fluid that bathes the brain and the spine. It occupies the cavities within the brain called ventricles, seen here. It covers the outside of the brain, anything that you see in blue. It also travels down the central canal of your spinal cord. In your spinal cord, you have a central canal. It's a hollow tube, it goes all the way down. And it also bathes the outside of your spinal cord. In you, in each of you right now, you have 150 milliliters of cerebrospinal fluid right now in your body. It turns over three to four times a day. You produce this much CSF in one day. Here's a sagittal or side view of an MRI of an adult human. The CSF is colored in red. From this image, you can see how it bathes the entire outside of the brain, as well as the spaces inside, and the entire outside of the spinal cord. Our central nervous system is floating in and being bathed by this fluid. Interestingly, the cerebrospinal fluid goes all the way down to the sacrum, but the spinal cord ends at what we call lumbar vertebrae 2. Just keep this in mind for future slides. Where does this fluid come from? This is you, this little black spot. Right there. That was you, each and every one of you as an embryo. You see the amniotic fluid on the top, you see the yolk sac, and you see the chorionic fluid. Look at how you are essentially developing, surrounded by fluid, enclosed in fluid, and totally supported by fluid in your embryologic development. You were organized and created by fluid. So where is the CSF? The CSF comes from the amniotic fluid through a process called neurulation. And I'm going to point here, OK? There is a sheet of cells called the neural plate. The amniotic fluid is on the outside. This sheet of cells undergoes what's called an invagination. The invagination connect, forms what's called a neural groove with neural folds on the outside. Those neural folds essentially fuse, 
and now the CSF is enclosed inside that cavity, and the amniotic fluid is on the outside. So there's a differentiation that occurs from the amniotic fluid to create the cerebrospinal fluid. Your brain and spinal cord was organized around this fluid. This is a scanning electron microscope image of a developing mouse, as if you are floating in the amniotic fluid. So you're watching the mouse in the amniotic fluid. Here you see the neural folds developing. They become more and more slender. There's a more clear invagination. And then, if you look here at 16S, what you see here is that some of the folds have fused, but there's this space that's still open. That space is essentially where it still hasn't fused yet. So you can still have mixture of the, of the, of the amniotic fluid and the cerebrospinal fluid. Okay? And then, once it's fused in 19S, you get no more mixture. So the amniotic fluid is on the outside, and the cerebrospinal fluid is on the inside. Initially, your embryonic brain is a hollow fluid-filled vesicle with cerebrospinal fluid on the inside of the tube and amniotic fluid on the outside of the tube. As you develop, the brain and spinal cord enlarge and differentiate, and the cerebrospinal fluid continues to bathe the inside and outside of your entire central nervous system. So here you are as a tiny, little embryo, completely surrounded by fluid. As you start developing awareness as an embryo, you are bathed in this primordial fluid, the amniotic fluid, in your mother's womb, starting with the amniotic fluid and slowly differentiating into the cerebrospinal fluid. Now in you, in each and every one of you, it bathes your entire central nervous system inside and outside your brain, traveling all the way down the central canal of your spinal cord, all the way down to your sacrum. So what is the role of the CSF? Let's take a view evolutionarily. It is actually thought that the CSF system evolved as a way to receive signals from the environment required for the functioning of the nervous system. Evolutionarily, brain cells on a starfish in the ocean that make contact with ocean water are very similar to the same cells that are found on the neural plate that I mentioned before. Throughout evolution, as there becomes a closure of the body plan and sort of an internal and external environment begins, such as a sea worm, the cells that are contacting the inside of the sea worm are similar to the cells that actually form the neural tube. In the sea worm, it gets mixture of the internal, of the external seawater and an internal seawater. There's still that mixing of fluids. Very similar to what I described, the cerebrospinal fluid mixing with the amniotic fluid prior to complete fusion. Evolutionarily, seawater is the first internal fluid environment of the brain. These cells that contact the surrounding fluid have a special role of receiving and transforming information from the fluid, whether that is ocean water like a starfish or CSF in vertebrates like you and I. Our ancestral CSF is seawater. So how did I become so fascinated with the CSF? It started looking at this slide. In this section, through the head of a human embryo at eight weeks of development, you see the developing brain I did not know what this structure was inside this sort of space, so I asked my colleague who said that was the choroid plexus. Well, the choroid plexus produces CSF. If the structure that produces CSF is so large, I knew that the CSF had to have an important function developing. Our developing nervous system is essentially bathed in this fluid. From our research and other people's research, we can say that the CSF provides essential survival and growth factors to the embryonic and adult brain, and it provides a fluid niche for neural stem cells for survival, proliferation, and differentiation. So from a biological, purely molecular perspective, the information in the CSF, whether that information is coming from a protein, a hormone, a growth factor, or any molecule, is being conveyed to the brain via the fluid. We published an article in the journal Neuron, and we designed the cover image for that based on our vision of the CSF. What you see here is the continuum from an embryo to the adult. This change in color represents the changing proteins that are necessary throughout those individual time periods for your brain. 
But the blue essence, the light of the CSF, that represents a continuum of energy within the fluid that is ever-present, regardless of age. So the majority of the roles in the CSF that we know about today are listed here. It transports nutrients and hormones. It regulates the circadian rhythm. It regulates appetite. Provides guiding cues for cell migration. Instructs stem cells to proliferate or differentiate. Creates an ionic balance. Eliminates waste. Supports and protects the central nervous system. Creates a buoyancy and shock absorption for the brain. What else could it do? Here we see two quotes from Dr. Randolph Stone, the founder of Polarity Therapy, a holistic healthcare system. The soul swims in the CSF. The cerebrospinal fluid seems to act as a storage field and a conveyor for the ultrasonic and light energies. This is a quote from Dr. Sutherland, one of the founders of cranial osteopathy, who said this about one of his teachers. Dr. Still envisioned the cerebrospinal fluid as an intermediary in the movement of divine intelligence, a channeling of creation into embryologic segments and irrigating them with life, giving form and function and order and intelligence to our existence. Just as flower remedies demonstrate that water is able to absorb, store, and transmit energy of plants, or as Dr. Emoto showed, that water could store the energy of words, the cerebrospinal fluid may absorb, store, and transmit the essence of the source and allow us to experience and be aware or conscious of our beingness. As I mentioned, the CSF covers the entire outside of your brain. Let's, took it, let's take a look at the CSF on the inside and allow the structure of the ventricles to help us understand its function. Why are the ventricles of the brain formed the way they are? The blue structures you see here are the ventricles in your brain. Pretty interesting structures, okay? This is the lateral ventricle. Why does it have to make contact with the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe? Why is there this little beak back here that actually has to go back and project into your visual center of the brain for optic? Why is the third ventricle here created such that it has this little beak that goes all the way out and contacts the pituitary gland? Or this little structure in back that needs to make contact with the pineal gland? What do the cells look like that contact the CSF? This is a scanning electron microscope image of the wall of the ventricle. So the inside of the wall of the ventricle that making contact with the CSF. What we see is that these cells have cilia on them, or what we call some slender-like antenna. These cilia can beat to create fluid-like movements. They're also like little antenna monitoring the fluid. They have receptors on them to pick up information. What are some of those receptors? There's photoreceptors that, in, that pick up information about light. There's chemoreceptors that pick up information about growth factors, ions, hormones. And there's also mechanoreceptors that pick up information regarding the flow, movement, and vibrations that are actually occurring in my head. Just to give you a sense, two important molecules that are found in the CSF are melatonin and DMT, each derived from tryptophan and believed to be released by the pineal gland into the CSF. Melatonin regulates sleep-wake cycles and is important for circadian rhythms. DMT is found widespread in the plant kingdom. DMT-containing plants are used widely for shamanic rituals to produce powerful psychedelic near-death and mystical experiences. And the endogenous function of DMT is still not known. However, it is hypothesized that it's released at birth, death, and during vivid dreams. Imagine, therefore, for a minute, that the CSF, as a vehicle of transmission of information, quickly something gets released in the CSF. It can transmit that, single, that signal to multiple parts of the brain simultaneously, using no synapse, with total synchronization of your brain at once. After I gave my talk a few years ago, many people wrote to me and described a fluid-like wave bathing their spine, rising from the sacrum to the crown during a kundalini awakening. So I, was touch, so I wanted to touch on that for a moment. The kundalini in yoga theory is a primal energy located at the base of the spine. Some say residing in the sacrum like a sleeping serpent, serpent waiting to be awakened. Yogic practice of kundalini is awakened and physically moves up the central canal, the shushumna, to reach the third eye and subsequently the crown chakra for awakening to, to occur. Could, this, could the CSF actually be a transporter of this primal energy? Let's take a look at some of the anatomy. The sacrum is a large triangular bone at the base of your spine. 
The origin of the word comes from the Latin os sacrum, which means sacred bone. The end of the spinal cord, as I mentioned, is approximately L2, and the CSF goes all the way down to about sacral level two or three, shown there. Interestingly, there's a filament called phylum terminale that goes all the way from the bottom of the spinal cord to the coccyx. Remember, within the spinal cord, there's a canal filled with fluid that goes all the way up the spinal cord, middle of the fluid, into your third ventricle. Some people claim there's a small fiber even within that canal of the spinal cord that is made of condensed CSF proteins that goes all the way to the pineal gland. Here are the words of Swami Vivekananda. See how these words relate to the anatomy that was just described. According to the yogis, there are two nerve currents in the spinal cord column called Pingala and Ida, and a hollow canal called Shushumna running through the spinal cord. At the lower end of the hollow canal is what the yogis call the lotus of the kundalini. They describe it as a triangular in form. In the symbolical language of the yogis, there is a power called the kundalini coiled up. When that kundalini awakes, it tries to force a passage through this hollow canal, and as it rises step by step, as it were, layer after layer of the mind becomes open and all the different visions and wonderful powers come to the yogi. When it reaches uh, when it reaches the brain, the yogi is perfectly detached from the body and mind. The soul finds itself free. The left is the ida, the right pingala, and that hollow canal which runs through the center of the spinal cord is the shushumna, where the spinal cord ends in some of the lumbar vertebrae, a fine fiber issues downward, and the canal runs up even within that fiber, only much finer. The canal is closed at the lower end, which is situated near what is called the sacral plexus. Vivekananda mentions the Ida and the Pingala and Shashumna. These are the three main nadis. Nadi comes from Tamil, meaning nerve, blood vessel, or pulse, or Sanskrit, meaning channel, stream, or flow. Ida lies to the left of the spine, Pingala to the right of the spine, Shashumna runs along the center of the spinal cord. Some images have the Ida and Pingala doing a helix crossing, the Shashumna, and at each intersection is a chakra. To me, Ida and Pingala represent the pineal and the pituitary glands. The Shashumna coming up from the center of the spine is a tube full of cerebrospinal fluid, all meeting at the third ventricle, that fluid radiant space in the middle of our head, the crystal palace, the cave of Brahman. It is the space where the marriage of the yin and the yang energies of the pineal and the pituitary gland come to perform a perfect harmony within the fluid of that space. It is my belief that this is the place for the birth of the I am in physical form, where through dispersion of the energy within the fluid, our entire brain is simultaneously bathed within the differentiated fluid from the source, providing the synchronous, unified experience and awareness of our true essence. Another practice related to the CSF is the Kachari Mudra, which some people contacted me as well. The Kachari Mudra is a yogic practice where the tongue is rolled up to touch the hard and then the soft palate. Then with practice, it is inserted behind the uvula into the nasal cavity behind the palate. This may take months or even years of practice. Once inside the nasal cavity, the tongue can stimulate nerve centers that are connected to the brain. This produces a liquid that emanates from the roof of the cavity. That liquid has been called a nectar or amrit, which flows from the roof of the navel cavity. Amrit is a word for Sanskrit meaning without death or immortal, which bestows immortality. This muda has been described to allow people to experience the vast expanse of consciousness when they taste this nectar. So how is this connected to the CSF? Well, here is your tongue, this muscle down here. This is your uvula. This is what you see here, the olfactory bulb. This is what you smell with. The olfactory bulb nerve fibers come through the cribiform plate. The cribiform plate is all bathed in CSF, and here's your nice little pituitary gland sitting. The spaces that you see up here is all cerebrospinal fluid. Could the amrit or nectar be the cerebrospinal fluid? I believe it may. 
Evolutionarily, the, the CSF system evolved as a way to receive signals and transmit information. Our ancestral CSF is seawater. So imagine your connection to the fluid that surrounded you as an embryo, to the fluid that is bathing the inside and outside of your entire central nervous system right now, to the totality of all the fluid in all the oceans that have ever been present in history. It's not showing. It's fine. It, there's a clear light coming from the, from the inside. Does it show? Oh, it does. I don't see it. Imagine, therefore, this fluid bathing the inside and outside of our brain and spine, being a perfect vehicle to transmit information to the brain, whether that is melatonin to help us sleep or DMT to help us have vivid images and experience holistic states of consciousness, or as the fluid conductor of source energy to our physical bodies to transmit the experience of our I am, our beingness, as well as be able a vehicle for cosmic consciousness, that awareness of the universal mind and one's unity with it. I'd like to thank my wife, my son and daughter, all the sand organizers, Maurizio Zaya and Lisa, Nisargadatta Maharaj, my PhD advisor, Chris Walsh, and Maria Lettinen, who I worked with in the lab, Dr. Randolph Stone, Jeannie and Jeffrey Wilson, all of you, the CSF and life.